and we pray together. You guys with me on that? So that'll be this e that, that'll be Thursday evening this week. And then next week, there will be no uh, Lighthouse as a holiday, I believe, on the Monday next week, okay? So that's their, one of the announcements. Uh, the next thing is, is that we have coming, I think next week, next week the 19th is Pentecost Sunday. It's a pretty exciting day. You're not going to want to miss it because Sarah is going to be preaching that day on Pentecost Sunday. So I encourage you to bring people out, and, and she's got a good message she's been working on, and uh, I'm excited to uh, hear, hear, hear that deliver this week, right, uh, coming up. Then on the 26th, uh, we're going to be doing a special service. Look at your neighbor again and say, 9 a.m., Okay, that is going to be our lighthouse, our, our flow at nine. It's going to—it's a special kind of uh, service. But I believe that you know when we come into the house of God, it's important for us to know that you know we are gathered together to worship God. We're gathered together to pray. We don't have to wait for a special occurrence for the Holy Spirit to be able to show up in our midst. Okay, He's here to be. That's why we pray together at every gathering that we do we pray in each of our services and so that particular day though we are going to be taking our prayer nights that we normally do we're going to be incorporating that more into the service that day and it's going to be a little bit more as i said hands-on come that day willing and able to participate we're going to have some personal edification that will be going on that day we'll be laying on hands uh, for people for prayer uh for healing and, and anointing as well amen so that's going to be a great day. You're not going to want to miss it. And then on June 2nd, the following week, we'll make more announcements on that. But we're going to be out in the park in Leamington. There is going to be a water baptism at that service. Okay. Uh, there will be an opportunity for people to get water baptized in the lake. You know, and uh, if you want to do that, if you need to, you know, somebody needs to get baptized or you need to get baptized, there are sign-up forms that you can. You can also bring them out the day of, and we'll make sure that we teach them the Word of God uh, and what it means to be water baptized, and we will get you guys out there in the lake. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, what other announcements do I have? Is, is that? I think that's it, but I feel like. I'm just feeling a sense in the room right now. Can I do this? Is yeah, that okay? Yeah, I'm just feeling a sense in the room right now that there's an atmosphere of prayer. And so I just want to ask you guys, you know, to stand up with me if you can, and let's just begin to pray for a minute. I believe, you know, as the, as, um, the uh, disciples, as they were, as the apostles, they were in the uh, upper room, and they were waiting for Jesus, and they were just expecting him to come, and they were expecting him to, to, to move, and they were there in one accord praying all together, and as they were doing this, they were waiting with great expectation, and I feel that there's a great expectation in the room, and so if we can just join together in prayer right now for just a quick minute so that we can just expect God to move in this place. If you know how to pray in tongues, I want you to begin to pray in tongues with me. I want you to pray with fervor from the depths of your heart, just expecting God to move and say, God, we need you. We need a move of God right now, right here in this place. Let's just lift up our voices. Let it. Let that roar come out. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you are here in the midst of us, and we will not move until you are moving. Father, I thank you that you are just showing up in this place, Father, that you are showing up in our individual lives, in our family lives lives, that you are with us everywhere we go, Father. And so today we dedicate this day to you and we say, come and have your way. Come and have your will right now, right here in this place, Father. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can be here. We can be willing vessels and we choose to give our lives over to you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that your presence is alive in this place. God, we thank you that you are moving. We thank you for your presence. God, I thank you that you haven't left us, you haven't forsaken us, but you are with us always, even to the end of the age. And so, so today, God, for every person here who is expecting, God, I thank you that you are moving beyond their expectations. God, I thank you that today in the, in the things that we have been expecting you to move, that we would take off our, our thought processes of how you should move, God, and we will just let you move in the way that you're going to move today. God, I thank you that you are exceeding our expectations today, God. We thank you that you are more than enough. You are more than enough, God. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, and you provide for us in every area that we have need of, Father, that you are there for us for 
for our financial needs. You are there for us for our emotional needs, for our mental needs, Father, for our physical needs. God, you know every need. And right now, in Jesus' name, we just thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. Today, Father, I thank you that healing virtue is going forth from your word today. God, we thank you for your word. We take you at your word, and I thank you that you sent that word to heal us today. And so today, God, we just lift up our hands, and we receive everything that you have. And we say, God, we are here, ready and willing and waiting for you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, amen. 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 Okay. All right. Amen. I just, I, I was just feeling even at the end of worship, I was just feeling this, like, you know, there, there's a great expectation in the room. And I think that's a good thing. You know, our, our message isn't actually on expectation today, but I just, I, I just, I feel like God is saying we have to expect. We have to expect him to move. We have to wait for him to move with that great expectation. We have to be in the place where we say, God, I'm not moving until you move. We have to be in that place where we say, God, I'm not willing to waver. I'm not willing to falter. I'm not willing to take a step no matter which way it is unless you say you need to take this step. He's asking for full obedience. He's asking for full submission into his will. And he wants us to hear his voice. He wants us to listen to him, and he will speak to you. See, here's the thing is that God will speak when we listen. He's always speaking. But sometimes we have a hard time hearing what he's saying because the things of this world and the distractions and the everyday life and the, and the hustle of everything going on is just distracting us and keeping us from being able to just quiet our minds down. You know, there's a world version of meditation. I'm sorry, not really, but... <laughs> There's a world's version of meditation, which is to empty your mind and just, you know, l sit there empty and, you know, you just get into that, that position. But see, that's a perverted way of God's meditation. See, true meditation is that we need to empty our mind of the things that are, are distracting us and the ways of this world, and we need to fill our mind back up with his word. We need to fill ourselves up with his presence. We need to get back into his presence, and we need to say, God, I need everything that you are inside of me. I need everything that you have for me in this moment because I can't live without you. And as we get to that place of meditating on his word day and night and every moment we begin to just quiet ourselves and then we can hear the stillness of his voice we can hear him moving and we can see him moving and find out the ways that he's going to say he's going to go see sometimes we expect him to move in a certain way and he's not r ready to move in that way he doesn't want to move in that way he wants to move in a greater way in a different way but we're stuck in i gotta go this way i gotta go this way and so he says just submit to me listen to me i'll guide you I'll lead you. Amen. Ready? Amen. You can tell she's been away for a couple of weeks now. You know, she's just like already on fire to be able to start preaching today. I'm excited. So I'm excited. It's a she, good day. She's excited. That's good. So you guys ready for the, you guys ready for the message today? Yeah. All right. I'm ready. So we're, we're going to skip. We're not going to do those introductory slides today. I'm going to go straight into the, to the message. You know, you know, how many know it's been a really kind of crazy, you know, last couple of years, right? And, you know, I think, you know, in every year that when there's, some, there's certain events that take place, you know, that people remember, um, you know, in regards to those particular years, you know, like, you know, if you look at, you know, what was happening in 2024, you know, there, there will be, or 2023, there'd be like, there's a war going on in Israel. This would be something that would be a highlight for the year. And, uh, you know, in, back in 2020, you know, and, uh, and the years afterwards, it was, oh, COVID was there. The world shut down, you know, because of COVID. And so every year, there's certain things that take place. And so there was a year that, that was on the map here called 1977. Anyone remember 1977? I don't, actually. Pastor Sherry wasn't even born yet in 1977. <laughs> and I was a whopping, I think, two. Yeah, so I, I wasn't very young. Uh, I, was, I was pretty young in, in 1977. But, but in that year, there was a bunch of uh, different highlights that took place. And I just want to quickly go through a few of those highlights uh, with you of my top 10 things that took place in 1977. I'll start. You go ahead. You had to start today. <laughs> All right, number one, Jimmy Carter was sworn in as the 39th U.S. president in 1977. Yes. yes. The Concorde supersonic took its first flight. I remember that was a big deal for me. I remember, uh, you know, I had this little Concord, uh, a mug that had the Concord on it, and it was that super, you know, these big flights over the Atlantic, yeah, right? So, yep. Uh, Elvis Presley died, or 
at disappeared. least disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they had the, uh, the New York blackout happened. There was that mm -hmm. big New York blackout. Mm -hmm. Well, how about Arnold Schwarzenegger, Pumping Iron was released. Yes, for mm -hmm. those of you who, who are not familiar with that, that was like his big <laughs> debut into the whole acting mm -hmm. uh, world. That was Pumping Iron. The, the Alaskan oil uh, pipeline also opened in 1977. How about this, the Atari 2600, the Commodore, and the Apple II computers were all released. Yes. As a matter of fact, I think we still have a Commodore at home. I do. I have a Commodore 64 still sitting up in the closet. I figured one day it might be worth some money, so I've, uh, I've, uh, I've hung on to it all these years. Uh, another great soccer player, Paley, actually uh, played his last game in 1977. Saturday Night Fever aired Disco with John Travolta, John right? Travolta. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and then, but, but none of these, as big as they were, were as big as the last one that took place that year. And that there was, in 1977, Star Wars A New Hope opened up in the theaters. <laughs> I see we have a Star Wars fan in the, in the room, right? And You're going to like this message then today. <laughs> see, and... and that there, when it, when, it, when it came about on the scene, it, it really brought out, like, I mean, this was one of the top, you know, grossing, you know, movies. I think they've reached, like, $10 billion and, and so forth over the years. And, and for those of you who, who have not actually seen it, I know there's some people who have never seen Star Wars in their lives. I, I, I'm, not, I'm surprised it happens. But nonetheless, it's, it's a whole movie that's based about hope and good versus evil. Uh, the movie also introduces something called The Force. Anyone ever hear of The Force? You know, and it's like about all this different, you know, things that are all around us. And it's how the, the Jedi, you know, Luke Skywalker, they are able to, you know, use in wild instances where their, their power and their strength kind of comes from is, is the force, right? Now, I was just, we were just away last week, but I mean, even, even May 4th was last weekend, am I correct? And that is what is known as Star Wars Day. What does everyone walk around on Star Wars saying? May the fourth be with you. And, uh, and so it's like, it's a big deal. So you're probably sitting here, what in the world does Star Wars or the Force have to do with Mother's Day? I'll tell you. I'm gonna, Pastor Sherry's going to tell us. <laughs> Wait. Do or do not, there is no try. Oh, she's <laughs> quoting Yoda now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go All on. right, so we will get, we'll get to Yoda. But uh, today's message is going to be called The Force, A Push and Pull Story. And that is what we're going to be uh, teaching on today. So it's going to have some, some tie-ins. We'll see how this goes. Yeah, we're going to see. So we're going to start way back in the middle, way back in the middle, with Mary. We're going to go to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Anybody hear of these people, Mary, Joseph? You guys know who I'm talking about? It says the virgin's name was Mary. And having, came, having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Like how amazing that, that moment would have been for Mary. Amen. But if we go to uh, drop down to verse 46, it says, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And then, you know, we can read in Matthew 1, this is the birth of Jesus, says the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Anybody ever dream? We were just talking about dreams this morning. I dream I a lot. dreamed a dream. I dreamed a dream. So he dreams this dream, and the angel appears to him, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, 
for he will save his people from their sins. You see, this is an interesting thing. I know it's not Christmas today. Normally, this sounds like the opening to a Christmas service here, you know, talking about the birth of our Savior. But what I want to talk about is how Mary was chosen to be the mother of God. Could you imagine the responsibility and the weight of that, um, of what she probably felt in that time of knowing that she was now going to be um, entreated with the responsibility of raising deity in her household? Like, I think about things, you know, as a mother, if I, I think about just, you know, raising my kids, how many people think about their children in such a way that they think that they are so precious to God that I have to do everything and I bear this amazing responsibility of raising my children up in the ways of God. Like, if we took that same thought that Mary had in that moment when she was given the responsibility of raising Jesus... And we think about that with our children, and we think about how, you know, it is such an amazing gift to be able to have children. And it is such an amazing thing for God to give that responsibility to us. I think, I feel like I've said this phrase actually a lot lately, like, God has given me the responsibility to raise my children in the way that they should go. It says that if we raise them in the way that they should go when they're older, they will not depart from it. And it, this is an important thing. And so, you know, here the, the angel Gabriel, he calls Mary highly favored and blessed among women. Like she had, like she was special. And, uh, and here the thing is, is that, you know, we know the whole estate of Mary. She wasn't married at this point. She was a virgin. And all of a sudden she finds herself with child. And you know, we know people like to talk, Right in our society. People talk a lot. Could you imagine maybe what Mary may have felt in that time of being, um, you know, even as Joseph was saying, he didn't want to make her a public example, right? She has to be, live out in the public knowing that here she is, an unmarried woman that is pregnant. And so I'm sure people talk a lot, but do you know Mary only cared about one opinion? Do you know whose opinion she cared about? God's opinion. Because she knew that it was only his opinion of her that mattered the most. And it didn't matter what other people said about her. And it didn't matter what rumors may have been circling around her. She knew that the opinion that mattered the most was that of her Heavenly Father. And she took that responsibility that he gave her to great heart. So Mary was operating in what we call humility. And she was operating in honor. And she was operating in grace of character. This was, these are great examples for us to be able to follow after in our lives. And see, with all of those things wrapped together, one of the things that, that really stood out is, is that Mary was a godly force, right, uh, here on the earth. And she was a, a godly force to be able to speak into the lives of her children. And so one of the things that we, we looked into here, and this is where we, we got into, def, I'm one of, I, you know, I like a lot of definitions sometimes, you guys, you know, when I preach, we look up words because I really believe they, they bring out a lot more to what the scriptures, you know, have to say. But when, when someone's a, a godly force or they exercise force, do you know that that word force has, has tons of meanings? I mean, a lot of times you look up a word and it only just has a couple little, little phrases attached to it, but not this word force. It's got all kinds of things attached. I want so it starts off, it says, it's strength or energy exerted uh, or a cause of motion or change or active power. That's the first kind of definition that it brings out in force. And then it says, moral or mental strength. That's also another definition. The capacity to persuade or convince, right? Have you ever come across somebody who has that, that they're, they're just they're forceful in their persuasion of you? You know, I was talking to someone not too long ago. And it was like, you know, if, if they talk to my father, you know, about a particular, they're, they're like, he's like, he's very persuasive, you know, and, that, and that's what they were communicating to me. They're like, he's very persuasive. And I said, that's good. That's a good thing when he's persuading you to, you know, into the word of God. And so, nonetheless, there's, there's those types. And it says, the quality of conveying impressions intensely in writing or in speech. So it's another way. So you can write, you can be something forceful even in your writing or in your speech or conversation. It can also be someone who can, uh, is compelled by physical, even violently, moral or intellectual means. You can coerce somebody by force, uh, even against their will. Or the last one is to raise or accelerate, even hasten the rate of progress or growth. 
So all of these, di all these different meanings, I, I tried to capture them as best as I could. And, and really what I really thought they brought out is that they all centralize around the ability to affect change. So look at the one next to you and say, the ability to affect change. Right? So, so sometimes it said the, the force can be done in a, in a negative connotation, right? But we're not going to emphasize even on the, on the negative sides of that. We're, we're going to look at the godly force. So when we use even that terminology today, force, we're looking at the godly force that is in alignment, right, with God's will here in the earth. And so when uh, there's, and, and, uh, and that's kind of where we're going we're gonna to emphasize this. Now, there's beyond this. Now, these are all just the definitions of, of force in the dictionary. But do you know that there's a scientific meaning of the word force as well? And so when you look up that, it's an interaction that changes the motion of an object if unopposed. Which means that, that it is a push or a pull experienced by any type of an object. I mean, even those, you know, who, who are familiar with the Star Wars side of things, you know, there's a, there's a push that they use or the pull, you know, they'll pull something in. And this here is really what it's talking about is that if they push or pull on an object, is that of using force? So, for instance, if I, if I hug Pastor Sherry and I pull her into me today, right, that there is an exertion of my force, Right. And if I could also, uh, she, she could push me away, right, really which is you. also an exertion of force, right? Now, the whole key to this also says is that it has to be off, it has to be unopposed, okay? So if force is exerted and there's an opposition to that force, right, it doesn't have the ability to, to really comply with the definition of what it's looking to do. Yeah, like I think about, you know, um, I don't know if any of you guys ever experienced this, but when I try to give my daughter a hug sometimes, and she doesn't want to hug at that moment, and so I'm, I'm trying to grab her, and she's got her arms pushing me away. And, or collapses and, to the ground And she altogether. collapses to the ground. What ends up <laughs> happening is we both end up falling over, and one of us either is laughing and the other one crying or... <laughs> No, but, um, but while there's opposition, there is an easy way to lose your footing. And so if there is a godly force that we are meant to follow and we have opposition to that, we can find ourselves faltering in our step. It's just a little added nugget there. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Jesus. So I want to fast forward a few years. In Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 43, it says, Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. And after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. <laughs> you guys know this story when Mary loses Jesus. Could you imagine losing the Son of God? <laughs> I don't know. I, th I think about things. Anyways, I think about just, you know, my, I remember one time my neighbor had said that when she first... Um, when she first had uh, a baby, she wa she was recovering. It was the first couple of days at home, and she forgot she had a baby. And she wa she was like, "Oh, I want to go for a walk." And so she went out and she went for a walk. And then she was halfway around the block. And she was like, oh, "I forgot my baby." And then she went back to her house and she said, "Like it was just you know, it was it was a thought." But anyways, here in this situation, you know, um, they lose Jesus. And and the thing to remember here is that Jesus is 12 years old. Okay, he's not like a little baby anymore, but he's also not a full-grown adult yet. He is 12 years old. And, you know, sometimes 12-year-olds like to go off and do their own thing, right? And so here Jesus is, you know, um, off in the temple, and he, he didn't come with them, and they didn't know that, uh, that they were there. And so here they have to return to go back and find him. So the, the passage picks up here in Luke 20, uh, 2, 44. And it says, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day, and then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. You know, Jesus wasn't just missing for three minutes. He was missing for three hours. He was missing for three days. You know, as Pastor Sherry brought out, how many of you have ever lost, your, lost sight of your child just for that moment in time? You know, you're, you're in a crowded place, and all of a sudden, you look behind you where your child's supposed to be, and they're gone. And what happens? You know, your heart just kind of, 
jumps up on the inside, and, and all of a sudden, you're, you know, there's that freak out moment. You know, you're racing, you're running around, maybe it's just around the aisle or whatever it may be, and they're all just sitting there like, hey, I'm right here, Mom, you know. And so I, I, I remember... You know, here you got to remember, every, this, this is the Passover that's happening. So all of the countryside, all of the area, all the nation around, uh, of, of nation of Israel is all commencing and coming together into the city of Jerusalem. And then after the Passover takes place, they're all exiting out. So this is like a, a large crowd of people. You guys ever been in an area where there's just like a large mass of people? This is what was happening. And so, you know, sometimes we think about, okay, why, you know, you know, why did they not realize that he wasn't there? There, there was a lot of people. You know, I remember when I was little, we, we went to this place called Disney. Anyone ever been in Disney before? At the, at the end of the night, if you're on a special, on the special occasions, they have something called the electrical parade. Okay, and so when you go to see the electrical parade, what happens is, is that everybody in the entire park comes and converges together into what they call Main Street, and they have the Main Street electrical parade. And when you're there, what happens is, is that the parade comes, I got all this, you know, like fancy lights and machines and parade and all this, and everyone's there cheering and having a great time, okay? But then the moment that the parade ends, it's like mad chaos, because you got whatever there is, 20,000, 30,000 people, 40, whatever it is, all just, you know, making a mad exit towards the, the, the gate, right, to get out of the park. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yep. So when I was there as a child, right, one of my siblings decided right as the electrical parade ended that they were going to take off for a mad dash for the bathroom. <laughs> Unassisted. <laughs> and so, boom, they're gone, and all of a sudden, everyone's just right everywhere and so I remember you know my relatives at that moment in time like oh my like they like just could you imagine what had happened you know there's this massive crowd and all of a sudden the little five-year-old or four-year-old at the time was just gone and so you know an hour later you know they were found in the lost and found but I just remember so you can imagine you know they, 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 that was literally what it was, it was like they had the, the lost and found and that was where they ended up finding them but here could you just imagine what was going on with Mary you know, it's like, could you imagine the dialogue with, with you know, God that day? It's like, hey, God, I need a little help here. Uh, you know, the, your, your son's missing, and it's not just a few hours, but it's three days. Three days she's going through this, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, <laughs> mom in my household wouldn't be doing very well after, you know, a couple minutes, let alone a couple hours, let alone three days. Three days. I would be a wreck. I, yeah. I feel like I would probably not even sleep. I don't know. Like, and I know we're laughing about this, but it's not, it's not actually funny because if you're actually in that scenario, like there's, there's a great <laughs> panic that comes upon <laughs> you. And um, like when we, were, when we just got back from the cruise and when we were checking into the cruise, you know, there's like thousands of people that are all, you know, trying to check in for this cruise. And there was a little girl, she was probably about two or three, maybe three, something like that. And she thought it would be fun to kind of zigzag up and down the aisles. And so her parents were checking in and they were kind of letting her do that. But then she wouldn't come and she kept trying to sneak into other, other ways. And then you could see the panic on their face that was starting to kind of just like increase as they couldn't catch her. And other passengers were trying to help rally her to go and, uh, and to catch her. But, um, but could you imagine three days of you, you don't know where your child is, and let alone the Son of God. You don't know where the Son of God is. So I want to pick back up in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 47. It says, Every, so we know Jesus was in the temple, right? So when he, he wasn't really lost and he wasn't doing his own will, he was in, in the temple and he was teaching. So it says in verse 47, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And I'm sure his mother said to him, Oh, my son, why have you treated us like this? <laughs> probably not. I feel like she probably was like, <clears throat> son, why have you treated us like this? <laughs> but she says, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he says. He asks us the question, like she's saying this, and you know, after three days, he knows he's been gone for three days. He's been without his parents for three days. And he asks, like, why are you looking for me? And then he goes on to say, like, did you not know I had been in my father's house? He says, but they did not understand what he was saying. So when Jesus is, you know, what he's doing, he's, he's not doing his own will. He's in 
his father's house, and he's teaching, and he's, he's sharing knowledge with the other leaders, and, and they're gleaning from it, and it's amazing. Could you imagine if a 12-year-old boy got up here today and was saying all of these amazing things that you were just like listening, like, wow. This guy knows what he's talking about. Like, you know, here they are. And then, and then all of a sudden, his parents come and is like, <clears throat> where have you been? And he says, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? But see, here's the thing is that we know that Jesus was a child, 12 years old. And so here in this moment, Jesus was beginning to activate his gifts, his wisdom, his knowledge, and all of those things, and his time wasn't yet. And so Mary had to exert that godly force and reel him back in and say, the time has not come yet. This is not time for you to go and do this. And then, and then you know what happens? We don't hear about Jesus for a little while, a hot minute. Yeah. I was filling a couple gaps on that for them. Yeah, okay, you go. All right. So it says here, it says, and then they went down to Nazareth with, with them, and, what, and he was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all of these things in their heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and statue and the favor and in favor with God and man. See, what had happened here is that the parents recognized something that the other people and the teachers and so forth in the temple didn't recognize is that Jesus wasn't ready. Okay, so they had to pull Jesus back for a moment in time, and he, they, he needed that developmental time. He needed that protection. He needed that care. He needed to be under the instruction of the parents that were in the household to be able to accomplish and be the preparation phase of his life to be able to fulfill the call of God that was on his life, right? See, they recognized that. They knew that. They knew the responsibility that was there. And as Pastor Sherry said, so it says that he went and he was obedient to them. And then we don't hear anything from Jesus for almost two decades. Jesus is no longer on the scene. There's, no, there's a gap here until he starts into his ministry down the road. And so here he is. Now he's submitted into their process. I'm going to let Pastor Sherry kind of talk on that for a moment. But this is something that we need to realize is this that even Jesus, who was a son of God, he, his parents were not there to get him. They weren't there to kind of, you know, just, you know, uh, make a mess of particular things. They just knew that where he was at right now, he wasn't ready and prepared for in that moment. And he needed to come back under that care and the protection in the household. And they were gracious with him in that process. See, what's interesting is that we live in a society today where um, the, t the tables have turned. And you see the children beginning to override the parents in the household. Mm -hmm. And you begin to see the children are the ones who actually make the decisions and the parents comply and the parents make the decisions according to what the children want. See, if that would have been what happened with Jesus, things probably would have looked a little bit different because there was still time where he needed to mature. And see, Mary and Joseph, they knew that they needed to pull him back because there were things still that he needed to, knew, uh, needed to know and to um, develop in his life. He was 12 years old and he needed to grow a little bit more. See, they were operating in godly wisdom here because they understood the responsibility of what God had given them. And see, in this moment, Jesus wasn't overriding his parents. You know what happened? He submitted underneath their will. See, they had delegated authority that God had given them. God had given them the responsibility. And Jesus submitted to that authority that they had given them. He's the son of God. He could have said, you know, beyond, you know, you know, you know that I would be here about my father's business. Leave me alone and let me do what I got to do. Like he could have said that, but he submitted to his mother. And so we, we need to understand that in a household that the parents need to be able to take that responsibility with great, um, you know, uh, a, a great weight to say, God, I will take that responsibility that you've given me and I will raise these children. See, the children aren't always going to want to do exactly what you say. They're not always going to like it. <laughs> I, I'm sure. How many have experience with this? If you have children, I'm sure you have experience with this, right? Is that I had experiences this morning. No, and the thing is, <laughs> the, they don't always know what's best. But as we are, as parents, as we are submitting to God's will, and we are allowing his godly force to work through us, then we can raise our children in the way that they should go. And we can utilize that godly force to be able to direct them on the right path. 
so that when they're older, that they won't depart from the faith, so that when they're older, they won't walk away and say and question everything about their faith. So when they're older, they will still be able to get a job and submit to the authority of, of their boss, so that when they're older, they'll be able to be into a church and integrate into that with your deep roots and be able to say, I trust the authority that God has put here. And see, that is our responsibility as parents to be able to raise our children in this way. So when we are, we've been talking this year, you know, part of our theme this year has been what? Trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so this is the same process that Jesus had to trust in uh, his, his earthly parents, which was Mary and Joseph at that time. We also need to obviously trust in our heavenly father. Right? We need to be submitted into what he is saying and realize that he has our best interests that are in mind. So when, we, when he pulls us back, you know, sometimes God pulls you back. Sometimes, you know what God does? He prunes you. How many like it when you get pulled back and when you get pruned? No. Nobody. Right? But when we submit into those processes, we trust what God is doing in our lives. And so I really believe that said when Jesus was in this, this period of, of preparation, he was there, he was in submission, he was, he was there, and he was accomplishing getting ready for the will, plan, and purposes of God to be fulfilled in his life. And it says, and then later on, we, I said, we don't hear anything I told you for almost two decades, and then all of a sudden, what happens? He gets baptized, and, you know, see him, he recruits some disciples, and then the next thing we know, he's at a wedding in Cana. He's at the wedding in Cana, and we're going to read up in the wedding in Cana right now in John 2. Verse number one, it says, And on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, I love this story because this is the one thing that's great about this passage of Scripture. Everybody knows it. It doesn't matter whether you go to church or you don't know to church. Everybody knows how to quote the scripture here that says, Jesus made the water into wine, mm -hmm. right? It's just one of those scripture passages that always seems to stand out for, for the unbeliever uh, as well. And so in this particular time, one of the things that we realized is that at, in, in part of the Jewish culture, there was obviously wine that was there, and it was something that was important. There, I, I actually read into a little bit of the details of this, and it's like to run out of wine at a wedding was not only what they considered disrespectful, it was embarrassing. Uh, it could even lead to search, certain things like being ostracized by your community or even sued by those who were around you. That's how extreme the culture was at that particular time. I, 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 so anyways, so along comes Mary, and she sees what's going on, and she says, hey, they're out of wine. And how many, how many have ever, you know, you know have, have a mother, or, you know, you're that mother, or you've had a mother, you know, where, you know, they, they see something going on, and, and they just, they got to get involved? You know, it's like, you know, hey, that person there, you know, they lost their job and, you know, you're, you know, now you're, you know, you're, you're helping them out to do this here or this person's hungry, they need food or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different ways. They're, they're just, they're, they, they, they can't stand by idly, right, because there's something that needs to be done and they're going to take an action to be able to make that happen. You guys know what I'm talking about? This is what Mary was doing this particular day. And, and really what I want to bring out, which is really interesting here, is it says that even though she, she understood and she wanted to do something, right, her focus was not to just take an action of and of her own self, but what she did is she went and she turned to someone, the Son of God, and she went to him and she talked to him about the situation. Mm -hmm. How many times do we do that, right, where we go around, right, and we try to do things on our own, we try to take our own actions, and we don't go to, our, to, to the source, mm -hmm. which is God. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a key in that, mm -hmm. right? And Mary knew that there was a need. She saw the need, she knew there was a need, and she knew where she had to go to be able to get that filled. But when she went to, to him and she says, you know, like, we gotta do this, Jesus says, you know what his response? John 2, verse 4, Jesus says to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. You know, and it kind of seems like a little bit like, you know, maybe Mary's being pushy with like, Jesus, come on. Like, you, I know you got this. I know you can do this. Just like the pushy show, mom. show them what you can do. Come on. Like, you, mm -hmm. you did this at home the other day. No. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm sure she was just like, Jesus, like, 
I, I know who you are, you know who you are, and you know the ramifications of what's going to happen. If there's no wine here, then we need to be able to do something. So she's like, come on, do something, right? How many times do we feel like that with God, where we see the need, and we know that the, the ramifications of what's going to happen if that need doesn't get met, and we look at God and we say, God, come on, I know what you can do. Do it, please, now please. You know, how many times do we actually do this where we're just like, you know, but, but in this moment, you know, Jesus says, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And I wonder about this, this phrase, my hour has not yet come. And a lot of times, you know, we read this and we think that it has to do with like, hey, you know, he's saying to his mom, like, hey, listen, I'm not supposed to start my ministry yet. But I don't think that's what it's saying because he's already been baptized and chosen his disciples. So I would think that his ministry is already beginning. So why would he say my hour is not yet come? What he was referring to in that moment is that uh, to his death on the cross. And I can show you in John 12, 23, he's talking about his crucifixion. He says, Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified. He's talking about his crucifixion. And then in John 17, 1, it says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, father, the hour is come. Glorify the son, thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And so here in this time, you know, when, he, when Jesus is saying to Mary, like my hour has not yet come, he's referring to his crucifixion. So I, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I told you, I've read that passage over and over again, and I always just thought it was just simply talking about, you know, his ministry. And, and all of a sudden, something, you know, clues in on me that, you know, it's talking about something different. And now I'm sitting here reading this passage, and I'm like, what is going on? How does he go from, you know, hey, we're out of wine to my hour for, you know, the crucifixion, or, you know, the, the fulfillment of things has not yet come. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, like, how do you make this huge jump from one thing to the next? And so, you know, looking into it, here's one of the things I want to bring out. Is, is there something that was called uh, the Messianic Banquet, okay? And in Isaiah 25, 68, it brings out, it says, In this mountain of the Lord of hosts will make for all the people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines of the lees. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all the faces, the rebuke of his people. He will take away from all the earth and the Lord has spoken. So here's the thing. This passage is thinking about, obviously, the day of salvation that is coming, right? And so Mary realized that there's going to be, that there's, there is a feast that is going to take place. And the representation of this feast is actually surrounded by an abundance of wine, okay? And here, in, it says that all the nations, you know, will get swallowed up and so forth. And really what the mother of Mary is really basically trying to communicate to here is, is hey, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. Reveal yourself now to the people, right, about who you are in this moment, right? And this is really what's happening is, is that is the, the fulfill, he's like, she's saying, to fulfill that which you are as the Messiah, right, in this moment. And Jesus says, look, this is not the hour for me to be able to do that. That hour is yet still to come, right? right? So she was trying to gently push him, use that godly force to be able to push Jesus forward. But Jesus also had to realize and discern what the timing was mm -hmm. that he was in alignment with what his heavenly father had for him in those moments. But I love what happens next because we can read in John 2 verse 5 says, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And so here's the thing is that Mary knows the power of God. Mary knows exactly what he's capable of, and she, she sees the need that's got a, that, that needs to be met, and she knows that the answer is standing right here. And so she goes to the source, and she says this, and, and you know, whether, you know, however that goes, then she realizes and she recognizes that I can't tell him to do something. What I've got to do is tell the people that their answer is, is in submitting to his will. 
that their answer is in following the instructions that he gives. And so she says to the people, she doesn't go back to Jesus and say, you need to do this, you need to do that, and make sure this, and make sure that, and, and have this in order, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. How many know that's something that maybe mothers might do? <laughs> Jesus' mother did not do that. She went to the people, and she said, you know, no matter what, whatever he says to you, want you to do it and so you know what they do is that they he tells them to go and get the uh the the um jars the pots and he says to fill them to the brim with water and as i was studying this last night and i was just like there's so much more to this i wish we had hours to just st stand here and talk about it but they fill it up to the brim and then they they scoop it and then he says once they filled all these pots to the top he says now i want you to take a scoop out and i want you to bring it to the bridegroom and so i wonder in this moment did they actually see that there was wine in there now or did they knowing that these pot that the wine was gone and then in this moment they were putting water in these jars and they were about to go serve the bridegroom water but they trusted that the answer was there and that whatever they were going to do being submissive to God's will that they were going to be able to have the answer and by the time that they got to the bridegroom and they handed him the cup and he began to drink all of a sudden there was a miracle that took place and in that moment it wasn't just the wine that was there for the time in this moment it was the best wine for last and the Bible says you know in the last days that his spirit will be poured out on all flesh and in this time that we're living in you know the Holy Spirit represents wine wine represents the Holy Spirit and in this time we are sitting here in this room expecting God to move and expecting his spirit to be poured out and are we taking the water that we are given and we are saying you know what when we dip our cup in there that we are gonna come back and we're gonna have the new wine no matter what it looks like no matter what we're doing we're gonna be submissive to his will and say I am gonna go and I'm gonna receive the new wine because there is power in that wine there is power in the Holy Spirit moving there is power in God moving in this place and so he saves the best for last right and when you read this passage it says that now they were set six water pots of stones according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 to 30 gallons apiece and Jesus said to them fill the water pots with water and they filled them up to the brim and he said to them draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast and they took it and when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made into wine and they did not know where it came from but the servants who had drawn out the water knew and the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to them, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have now drunk, then the inferior, and you have kept the good wine until now. So Pastor Sherry just kind of summarized what took place. Here's the thing I want to bring out, though, is that Jesus didn't just give a little bit. He didn't just make a, uh, enough wine to be sufficed. He made 180 gallons worth of wine. That's abundance of wine. And, he, and when Jesus, when God does things in our lives, he gives us out of the abundance, the overflow. And just like that, that banquet that was taking place at the end of time here, it says that there, it'll be an abundance of wine at this particular moment. And so here's the thing, here's some interesting things that I want you to realize about this passage. The master of the feast is the person who's responsible for taking care of everything. And it says that when he tasted it, he called upon the bridegroom because the bridegroom was the host and he was the one who was responsible for providing the wine. He didn't know that Jesus was the one who became the host and became the bridegroom at that moment and actually made the provision of the wine. And then when he did such, he stepped into a foreshadowing, which Jesus is what? The bridegroom. And when he stepped into being the bridegroom, he's a bridegroom who's coming back for the church. He's coming back for the church that's going to be a spot of wrinkle. He's going to be coming back for that Masonic uh, banquet where he's going to be the host, the bridegroom, where he's going to bring an end to death. He's going to bring an end to all of these different things. And I want you to guys to realize, God doesn't just do the minimum. Look at the one next to you. Say, God doesn't just do the minimum. He gives you an abundance in your life. Amen. Right. You know, there, there is something in this, in this season about doing, you know, I, I said a uh, quote from, what was it, Yoda or whatever, do or do not, there is no try. And we were kind of laughing about that. But there is a time that we are called to action in this moment. Mm -hmm. 
And see, we can't just sit back and expect that we're going to be able to enjoy the new wine. And we're going to be able to just experience all the things by just sitting here and doing nothing. See, God has called us to action. He has called us to do something, put our hand forth to the plow. He has called us to, to not just sit here and expect to be lavished upon, but he says, I need you to go and be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And so as we go out and as we are submitted to his will, and as we are looking to him saying, God, we need you and everything that we are doing. We need everything that you say I want to follow. And not just I want to follow. It's not just I'm going to try to follow him. It's going to be I am following you. I am. I'm making that decision, that stake in the ground, that line that we are drawing, where we're not going to be conformed to the ways of this world. We're not going to look like the rest. We're not going to look like those that are around us unless they are submitted to God's will. And then we will all look like Jesus together. I want to, I want to jump in. I want to, there's one part here I want to read. Why don't you all stand up right now because we're about to close. You know, one of the things that took place here is, you know, earlier we talked about, you know, even the definition of the word force. And one of them was to raise or accelerate or hasten the rate of progress or growth. And here in this moment, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, which is basically using that godly force to be able to hasten Jesus into the next steps that he was supposed to be progressing in in his life. And one of the things that he brings out here is, is that so she persuaded him to take an action. She persuaded him into a motion. And it says that once that first public miracle took place where he changed the water into wine, it wraps up and it says in John 2, 11, it says this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Here's one of the things that I thought was really interesting about it. It says that when these things happened, it was a sign that took place. There was signs that followed the life of Jesus. There was miracles that took place in the life of Jesus. And when those miracles took place, it glorified God. And people believed on him as the son of God. And even as and we're, uh, Sarah's going to be preaching even on this next week, we're going to be talking about signs. And one of the things that's also really interesting is that we as believers also have signs that follow us. And those signs that follow us are meant to glorify God, and they're also meant to be signs to the unbelievers to be able to point to the direction to know where God, who God is and his salvation and his mighty power. And so here Mary is, as we're wrapping up, she used a godly force, right, to be able to get people, and, and here's the thing, and it's the same principle, do we submit into God to be able to get off of the bench? There's a participation that God requires in his kingdom, and that requirement is not to just sit there and stand by idly in, in this household. Mary was not sitting there idly within the wedding at Cana, but she was there pushing Jesus forward because something needed to be done, and somebody had to do something about it, and it wasn't just going to be left to somebody else to be able to get it done. I was, she was going to take an action to be able to make sure that happened. And she went to God, and she worked with that persuasion, that godly force to be able to put Jesus into action. And how much do we do that in our own lives? Mm -hmm. As you were just saying that, I'm just, I'm seeing the faith that Mary had in that moment. You know, how many times are we expecting a miracle or we're expecting God to move, but yet we don't want to step out to, um, to do anything about it because we're afraid it may not happen. But what if it doesn't happen? And those thoughts begin to um, creep in and keep us from being able to actually expecting the miracle to take place. See, the faith that Mary had in that moment was that she knew, she knew intimately the power of God. And I feel that the question today is, do you know intimately the power of God in your life? Do you know what he can do? Do you expect him to do what you know that he can do? And in these moments, we need to begin to step out because I feel that even as we're leading up into Pentecost, I believe that the atmosphere is ripe for miracles to begin taking place. I'm standing in faith believing that we are going to start seeing people healed, that we're going to start seeing the dead raising up from the, from, from the grave, that we're going to begin to see eyes open and ears open, and we're going to see limbs regrowing, and we're going to see people healed from diabetes, and we're going to see people healed from cancers, and we're going to see people healed from anxiety and the mental anxiety. We're going to see people healed 
healed from um, just joint issues and all of the inflammation that's been going on inside of the body in Jesus' name. And in these moments, where is our faith? Is our faith here to be able to say, God, I know the power of what you can do, and I'm going to stand in that faith knowing that I'm not wavering. You are who you said you are, and I'm going to believe you at your word. Today, I want you to lift your hands if you're expecting God to move. God, today, we just thank you, Lord, that you are the miracle-working God. I thank you, Father, in this moment that you are just meeting us where we're at and that we are no longer going to sit by the sidelines and say that I'm just, I just, I want it, I need it, Father. But I thank you, Lord, that we are going to be so desperate for you and so desperate for you to move that we just can't expect anything else except for you to do what you know, what we know you can do. God, we thank you for the power of God, that it is flowing through us, God, and I thank you that we can take that out everywhere that we are, that we go. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that today, as we walk out these doors, that your power will, will accompany us. Father, I thank you that even as we are walking down the street, that people will begin to be healed in our shadow. In Jesus' name, Father, we take you at your word. We believe you for who you are. We believe in the power of God today. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have not left us in this time. I thank you greater things will be done in this time, Father, that we'll continue on and we'll be, begin to not just see miracles happen, but we'll begin to expect miracles to happen, that we will lay our hands on the sick and they will recover, that we will speak to the diseases and they will be gone, that we will raise those from the dead in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, that we can prophesy to those dry bones and tell them to live right now in Jesus' name. Today, God, we just speak to those bones, and I thank you, Father, that we are alive today. Wake up, sleeper. Wake up, sleeper. We will not sleep today. God, I thank you that you are just rising something up on the inside of us, that we cannot sit silent anymore, but we expect you to move, and we will put our hand forth to the plow this day. God, we thank you for your word today, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are alive in Jesus' name. God, I just pray right now for a special blessing even all over all the mothers right now, Father, all those who, who have desired to be mothers, who were never actually able to conceive, Father, or have a baby, but I thank you, Lord, that you are just blessing every one of those women in this room today, Father, and at the sound of my voice. God, I thank you. You hear the heart's cry of every person who's here in this room. And I thank you, Lord, that we can believe you at your word. Thank you for your blessing upon everyone today as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Mother's Day. Enjoy today. And we will see you guys on Thursday. We'll see you Thursday. At Flow Night. <laughs>